Welcome back to the God's Peculiar People podcast. Last week we talked a little bit about D.L. Moody. There's there's so much more that we can discuss about him, but we didn't even get into the books that he wrote or the schools that he founded. Uh, but today we're going to look at one of the men who worked very closely alongside him. But let's begin first with our verse of the week, which is Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There are myriads of hymns. I I recently got a new hymn book, and it has about um, 600 to 800 hymns in it, and has hymns like The Lily of the Valley, Hiding in Thee, A Shelter in the Time of Storm, A Soldier of the Cross, Faith is the Victory, and Jesus, uh, Trusting Jesus. But... These are just a few hymns. There's a writer. These hymns all have something in common. The music for each of these was composed by Ira Sankey, and they're still sung and found in our hymn books today. He's accredited with writing the scores for over 1,200 hymns. Now, as I kind of have alluded to in the previous episode and at the beginning, the names Moody and Sankey go hand in hand when we think of the great revival meetings of the Gilded Age. But one has to to wonder whether Sankey would have become a household name of the age if he had not joined Moody in his work. Prior to the meeting of Moody and Sankey in 1870, Sankey had already proven himself a gifted singer, using his voice to encourage troops in the war between the states and in the formation and leading of choirs. Ira Sankey's Ira story begins on August 28, 1840, in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, where he was born to parents David and Mary Sankey. Some of Sankey's earliest memories revolve around singing. In his autobiography, Sankey's Story of His Own Life, he wrote, As a boy, it was one of my chiefest joys to meet with other members of my family around the great log fire in the old homestead, and spend the long winter evenings singing with them the good old hymns and tunes of the church, which was the only music we had in those days. When at home, my father would frequently join us in these evenings of sacred song, singing a splendid bass while other members of the family carried the other parts. In this way, I learned to read music, and when I was eight years old, I could sing, I could sing correctly tunes, I could sing correctly, I could sing correctly such tunes as St. Martin's, Belmont, Coronation, etc. Irish childhood as described by his father, David. There was nothing very remarkable in his early or boyhood history. The gift of singing developed in him at a very early age, I say gift because it was God-given. He never took lessons from anyone, but his taste for music was such that when a little boy, he could make passable music on almost any kind of instrument. Sankey's zeal for singing and music was such that his father worried whether he would be successful. Sankey recounts an exchange between his parents on this issue. My father said to mother, I am afraid that boy will never amount to anything. All he does is run about the country with a hymn book under his arm. Mother replied that she would rather see me with a hymn book under my arm than with a whiskey bottle in my pocket. Ira Sankey made a profession of salvation when he was 16 years old. A year later, the family moved to Newcastle, Pennsylvania. This was the city he would call home for many years. Young Sankey made an impression on those in the church he had attended, and as a young man, he was elected both superintendent of the Sunday school and leader of the choir. In 1860, President Lincoln called for military volunteers, and Sankey enlisted in the 12th Pennsylvania Regiment. Some felt this would halt his mu- some felt this would halt his musical activities, but it actually gave him additional opportunities. Many of the young soldiers missed home and were hungry for the gospel music. Sankey's company was sent to Maryland, and he often led the singing at religious meetings held in the camp, finding other musicals. Finding other musical soldiers, he led and used them to help in the prayer meetings he was active in. They would also sing to cheer the sick and discouraged. It wasn't long before people in the area heard about the singers in the Union camp, and often they were invited out by families who wanted to listen to the boys in blue. Sankey's enlistment period was for three months. It was his desire to re-enlist, but his friends persuaded him to return to civilian life. 
there is an interesting story about Sankey's military service and how it and his life were almost cut short. On Christmas Eve, 1875, Sankey was traveling by steamboat. Passengers were mingling on the deck, and Sankey was asked to sing. Though he intended to sing a Christmas song, for some reason he was driven to sing the Shepherd's Song, what we know today as Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. The people listened intently, and at the conclusion of the song, a man with a rough, weather-beaten face approached Sankey and said, Did you ever serve in the Union Army? Yes, answered Sankey, in the spring of 1860. Can you remember if you were doing picket duty on a bright moonlit night in 1862? Yes, answered Sankey, very much surprised. So do I, said the stranger, but I was serving in the Confederate Army. When I saw you standing at your post, I thought to myself, that fellow will never get away from here alive. I raised my ri I raised my musket and took aim. I was standing in the shadow, completely concealed, while the full light of the moon was falling on you. At that instant, just as a moment ago, you raised your eyes to heaven and began to sing. Music, music, especially song, has always had a wonderful power over me, and I took my finger off the trigger. Let him sing a song to the end, I said to myself. I can shoot him afterwards. He is my victim at all ends, and my bullet and my bullet cannot miss him. But the song you sang then was the song you sang now. I heard the words perfectly. We are thine. Do thou befriend us. Be the guardian of our ways. These words stirred up many memories in my heart. I began to think of my childhood and of my God-fearing mother. She had many, many times sung that song to me, but she died all too soon. Otherwise, much of my life would no doubt have been different. When you finished your song, it was impossible for me to take aim at you again. I thought, the Lord who is able to save that man from certain death must surely be great and mighty, and my arm of its own accord dropped limp at my side. Since that time I have wandered about far and wide, but when I just now saw you standing there praying, just as on that other occasion, I recognized you. Then my heart was wounded by your song. Now I wish that you might help me find a cure for my sick soul. Deeply moved, Sankey threw his arms about the man who in the days of the war had been his enemy. And this Christmas night, the two went together to the manger in Bethlehem. There the stranger found him who was their common savior and good shepherd, who seeks for the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he had found it, he lays it on his shoulder. And when he hath had found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. Following his departure from the military, Ira secured a position with the Internal Revenue Department, and on September 9, 1863, he married Fanny Edwards, a member of the choir he led. They would go on to have three sons, Harry, Edward, and Alan. In addition to his job in choir, Ira was actively involved in the YMCA, of which he became secretary and later president of the local chapter. This work with the YMCA would direct the paths of Moody and Sankey to cross. In 1870, there was a meeting of leaders of the YMCA in Indianapolis, Indiana. As president of the local chapter, Sankey attended the meeting. It was a day or so into the meeting before the two met. Sankey was told that Moody would be at a 6 a.m. prayer meeting, and Sankey chose to attend. Following the prayer, someone suggested that Sankey sing a hymn. He chose, There is a fountain filled with blood. Here are Sankey's own words recording his introduction to Moody. At the conclusion of the meeting, Mr. McMillan said to me, Let me introduce you to Mr. Moody. We joined the little procession of persons who were going up to shake hands with him, and thus I met for the first time the man with whom, in the providence of God, I was to be associated for the remainder of his life, or nearly thirty years. Moody's first words to me after my introduction were, Where are you from? Are you married? What is your business? Upon telling him that I lived in Pennsylvania, was married, had two children, and was in the government employ, he said abruptly, You will have to give that up. I stood amazed, at a loss to understand why the man told me that I would have to give up what I considered a good position. For what? I exclaimed. To come to Chicago and help me in my work was the answer. When I told him that I could not leave my business, he retorted, You must. I have been looking for you for the last eight years. I answered that I would think the matter over, but as yet I had no thought of giving up my position. He told me about his religious works in Chicago, and closed by saying that the greatest trouble in connection with his meetings was the matter of singing. He said he could not sing himself, and therefore had to depend on all kinds of people to, leave, to lead his service of music. 
to lead to service of song. And that sometimes when he had talked to a crowd of people and was about to pull the net, someone would strike up a long meter hymn to a short meter tune and thereby upset the whole meeting. Mr. Moody then asked if I would go with him and pray over the matter, and to this I consented out of politeness. After the prayer we parted, and I returned to my room, much impressed by Mr. Moody's prayer, but still undecided. Knowing now how God would use Moody and Sankey, it is easy to criticize Sankey for his hesitancy to give up his steady job for the promise of very little. Moody himself refused to take a salary, but was prepared to offer Sankey $1,200 to join him in the work. Sankey's family was struggling to make, end meets, to make ends meet on a salary of $1,500 at the time, so it is not surprising that Sankey hesitated. But another interesting fact about Sankey is his, humil is his humility. There are some singers who have an air of superiority about them, and while they may sing beautifully, they may occasionally act like they are a special gift from God to the church. I'm sure you've met such people. But Sankey felt that there were other singers who should be considered for this opportunity. He thought there were other singers who could be considered for this opportunity. He did not think he was the only person who could fill the void of lead singer Moody was seeking to fill. Sankey... Sankey... Sankey was willing, but he also was aware that his musical and teaching abilities were being used of the Lord in his own church, and he wondered what would happen if he were to leave. After spending some time thinking and praying and consulting those around him, Sankey decided to join Mo decided to join Moody. Sankey decided to join Moody in his endeavors. Sankey says of his prayers for guidance, I presume I prayed one way, and he, Moody, prayed another. However, it only took him six months to pray me out of business. Sankey left his job with the government after ten years, and a man who worked with Sankey gave him this glowing testimonial. In the civil service, as in any other in the civil service, as in other departments of labor, he was noted for conscientiousness conscientiousness. He was noted for conscientiousness and patient, faithful attention to his duty. In his rank, he stood foot. In his rank, he stood. In his rank, he stood first in the district, and had the entire confidence of all the officers and taxpayers with whom he had official dealings. His superiors in office regarded him as one of the most prompt, correct, and reliable officers they had, and they were always ready to accord to him the honors of a faithful public servant. In his long connection with the service, there was never known any irregularities in his accounts or any loss to the government. He never took advantage of his office to his own gain or, or preferment, but faithfully and honestly cared for the interest of the government. On this account, he left the service with honor and with the regret of those who were associated with him. It has been correctly stated what a loss it would have been if Ira Sankey, one of America's greatest gospel singers and musicians, had remained simply a government bureaucrat in Pennsylvania, a tax collector. But like Zacchaeus and Matthew of so many generations before, he chose God's path and received both secular glory and eternal reward. Moody and Sankey began working together in early 1871, but in just a few short months, the Chicago Fire in October 1871 brought their efforts to a screeching halt, as most of Chicago, including the buildings they used for the meetings, burned. With no immediate future in Chicago, Sankey took a train east to his home. However, within two months after the fire destroyed Farwell Hall, Moody's church, Moody had a new tabernacle erected and telegraphed for Sankey to come. Despite Satan's efforts, these men were determined to go ahead with God's help. Now, there's so much to say about the journeys of Moody and Sankey through Europe uh, and, and other places around the world that they traveled. And other places that they traveled. But that's the, beyond the scope of what we can cover today. It is evident that the music of Iris Sankey... It is evident that the music of Iris Sankey was a ministry and not mere entertainment. His life was totally involved in other people. He gave up financial security that, so that through song he might tell others about true security found only in Christ. As a result of his total dependence on the Lord, his efforts were blessed and thousands were saved. 
something that I was not aware of about Sankey is that he was mainly a composer rather than an author, though he did write some songs as well. But Sankey set to music hymns by several famous writers, including Horatius, Horatius Bonner, Philip Bliss, and Fanny Crosby, who became a close friend. They met in 1876 and began a long long personal and professional relationship. When Moody and Sankey began to use Fanny's music in their crusades, her her work began receiving more attention. A few examples of Fanny's songs the men used were Blessed Assurance, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, To God Be the Glory, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, safe in the arms of Jesus, rescue the perishing, and Jesus keep me near the cross. We'll wrap up today's podcast with a story of one of the most popular songs Sankey composed and sang. We'll wrap up today's podcast with a story about one of the most popular songs Sankey composed the music for, and that he also sang widely. This excerpt was not written by me. It's taken from a, the website wellsofgrace.com. We'll try to have the link in the episode description. So it says, so this is the story of how the song came into, so this is the story of how the music was, so this is the story of how Senki sang the song So this is the story of Sankey's first and most famous composition, which was the 90 and 9. Sankey and Moody were en route from Glasgow to Edinburgh, Scotland in May 1874, as they were to hold a three-day campaign there. This was at their urgent request. Skip that part. Prior to boarding the train, Sankey bought a weekly newspaper for a penny. He found nothing of interest but a sermon and some advertisements. Then he found a little piece of poetry in a corner of one column that he liked. And he read it to Moody, but only received a re- polite reply. Sankey clipped the poem and ca- tucked it in his pocket. At the noonday service of the second day of the special, ser- special meeting, Moody preached on the Good Shepherd. Horatius Bonner added a few thrilling words, and then Moody asked Mr. Sankey if he had a final song. An inner voice prompted him to sing the hymn that he found on the train. With a conflict of the- spirit, with a conflict of spirit, he thought, This is impossible. The inner voice continued to prod him, even though there was no music to the hymn. He acquiesced. As calmly as if he had sung it a thousand times, he placed placed the little piece of newspaper on the organ in front of him. Lifting up his heart in the brief prayer, lifting up his heart in a brief prayer to God, lifting up his heart in a brief prayer to Almighty God, he then laid his hands on the keyboard, striking a chord in A flat. Half singing, Half speaking and half singing, he completed the first stanza, first stanza, which was followed by four more. Moody walked over with tears in his eyes and said, Where did you get that hymn? The 90 and 9 became his most famous tune, and his most famous sale from that time on. The words were written by Elizabeth Silfane in 1868. She died in 1869, little realizing her contribution to the Christian world. There's truly so much more we could talk about. Um, reading through this, I uh, trying to learn about Moody and Sankey. I didn't realize how many other lives kind of intertwined with them. Um, and we could kind of get stuck in this Gilded Age period just talking about those people. R.A. Torrey, um, Horatius Bonner, Philip Liss. Uh, we, we, we may end up doing that. We may end up just kind of getting st- stuck a little bit in this time period. Because um, there's some interesting, very interesting people. Uh, of course, Fanny Crosby, um, the story of Philip Liss. Um, Iris Sankey's connection to, um, is it Horatius Spafford, uh, whose wife and children died that wrote, um, or sorry, his wife didn't die, his children died, uh, who wrote the song, uh, It Is Well With My Soul. Just realizing how all of these, these people kind of intertwined, it had to have been an interesting, um, interesting time to have known all these people. We kind of... I don't want to say we honor them, but we we think of them as being exceptional Christians. And to think about, man, getting to, to talk to, get to know all these people, would have been pretty interesting to have been in that time period. But uh, now we get to look back on them and learn from their stories. Um, 
I think the biggest takeaway for me from the story of Iris Sankey is his humility. The, the part where I was, I was talking about that he thought someone else could do the job. Um, he didn't think that, oh, D.L. Moody wants me to come sing. Oh, I must be really great. Um, you know, he was willing to stay behind. He was willing to work in his own church to remain in, in obscurity. Um, rather than, than be this, you go on tour, like basically what we call it going on tour now, but going to preach in different meetings with D.L. Moody. He wasn't, he wasn't looking for fame and glory. Um, and yet God used him. So uh, what we talked last, last week about D.L. Moody being uh, simply a man, we find another, simply a man. You I think he had a little more education than Moody did. And, uh, that could have caused some tensions. It doesn't sound like it did. It sounds like they worked well together. But a very interesting story. Two very, very different men uh, coming together to work together and seeing how God used them is very, very interesting. Now, I think, unless plans change, what we're going to work on next for the next podcast will be uh, Moody and Sinky's travels. Talking a little bit about where they traveled to, some of the difficulties that they had when they traveled. Um, you know, they're God's peculiar people, kind of talking about some of the, the people and connections, some of the trials that they had, uh, it should be pretty interesting. So uh, hopefully you'll tune in next week for that. Uh, if at any time you have a question, comment, uh, suggestion, please feel free to come visit me on Instagram at God's Peculiar People Podcast. And until, I don't know what I'm trying to say, until whatever. Um, but that's it for this week. Let's talk to you again next week. I did that key closing up.